here is Peter Crabtree to talk to you about how community colleges, uh, particularly his college, Laney College, uh, addresses uh, renewable energy as far as energy efficiency. Peter is coming to us. Uh, he has a, a, he's principal investigator of the NSF project, educating technicians for building automation and sustainability. He's dean of instruction and career technical education at Laney College, and he's a PhD candidate at UC Riverside, and he wanted me to put on here. He's also a lifetime environmental activist. And with that, Peter. Thank you, Kathy. I'm fighting a cold today, so please excuse my voice. Um, there's a very simple way to do this. Well, it's interesting to contrast energy efficiency with, with renewable energy because um, energy efficiency tends to be invisible and not apparent, um, whereas uh, renewable energy is apparent. People can see solar panels um, and the uh, cachet of renewable energy to the extent that these, these systems have cachet uh, is much greater. So um, as Kathy was saying, we are a National Science Foundation project at Laney College. Our primary work has been in um, uh, commercial buildings and commercial building technicians and moving toward energy efficient commercial buildings. But we've also uh, been working a lot in um, residential energy efficiency, and we've also done some renewable, particularly solar, uh, which tends to be the easiest thing to put up and teach because the skill sets are much less. Um, residential energy efficiency and commercial uh, become very much more interdisciplinary, more complex, uh, and more difficult to teach. In the commercial sector especially, it has historically been a blue collar uh, profession, if you will, building technicians. And the real transition there is to move people from being blue collar to wh what we could call turquoise collar or green collar and become vastly more aware of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, Part of our work from the National Science Foundation, we, we funded a study on uh, building systems and building operations, which is on our website. Um, my own personal background is more from the social sciences, so I look very holistically, um, and I look at the policy context, which is very important. Um, how, what, what's the most salient thing we can say about our national energy policy in the United States? We don't have one, exactly. We do have one, actually. It's a, what we call in social sciences a, a de facto national energy policy, which primarily subsidizes big oil and so forth. Um, but I actually learned uh, from a contact at the Department of Energy that they were working on a national energy policy. Uh, but, uh, and I said, well, why don't you reveal it, let's air it, get it out there, sunlight it. And he said, no, it's secret. So, um, and it had three components, um, renewable energy, electric vehicles, and energy efficiency. Fairly simple, straightforward. How do we get to 2030 and survive? Um, but it's secret. 
perhaps stemming from the Atom Atomic Energy Commission days of Department of Energy, I'm not sure, or maybe the, the lack of will uh, in that agency. Uh, you can see there some of our key goals for our National Science Foundation project, um, conducting primary research, mapping career paths, developing curriculum, and working with uh, partners. Laney uh, is a 30-year-old community college in Oakland, California, uh, very heavily minority, 30% Asian, 29% African American. Uh, at the same time, we have this very interesting mix of uh, departments, including architecture, engineering, carpentry, electrical, and HVAC. And we've tapped into all of those departments to some extent uh, as we've developed these programs. We have had uh, incredible support from the National Science Foundation, PG&E. Uh, the Bechtel Foundation gave us a shot in the arm as we were working on the residential energy efficiency side. Um, we have partnered with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and researchers there, as well as the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland. Uh, and we have an extensive list of um, industry partners. Um, if we look at the uh, global context, I'm not going to dwell on these things, but um, the famous Australian biologist Tim Flannery has said that we are somewhere between the tipping point and the point of no return. Um, the point of no return, I suppose, is the point at which the forces become irreversible. Uh, CO2 is a very stable molecule that hangs around for a long time, and so the stuff we're putting in the atmosphere now will be there for a long time. And um, at what point this becomes irreversible is, is unknown, but we should certainly be thinking about it. Um, the Hindu Kush Himalaya ice sheet third largest ice mass on Earth. It's melting at 7% per year. It leads to the, to the notion that India and Pakistan will go to war someday, but not over religion, but over water. Um, as these rivers turn into seasonal rivers, uh, etc. And something we should be aware of, um, the people that really take global warming very seriously. Do you, does anyone know who that group of bureaucrats out there is? Anybody know? Military, military exactly. Department of Defense, militaries worldwide, because it's they who, who are looking forward, looking at the possibility of water shortages, shooting wars over water, food, millions of food refugees at the border, etc. cetera. Um, Fifty percent of our corn crop now in the U.S., I think somebody may have mentioned this earlier, is now going into ethanol production. Um, someone talked about a 25-gallon SUV taking the equivalent of food for, for one year. The question should, we should be asking is not, the economics of ethanol, but the economics of SUVs. Um, so layered onto this whole geo-global development is the capacity of, of our human systems to, to deal with this. Um, and at some point, of course, our political and social systems begin to break down along with our other systems. Our agricultural system, by the way, is about 10,000 years old. Um, and the Earth's climate has been fairly stable. We, we've been living in a stable period for about 10,000 years. And it has permitted that agricultural system to develop and um, reproduce food to support us. As we destabilize that climate system, 
we have no idea uh, what the underlying core food system is going to look like. Um, so this leads to a concept called progress traps. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. Um, it, have you all he heard about progress traps? Some? So the, the quintessential progress trap that's observable is Easter Island, which was settled by Polynesians about uh, the fifth century AD. Um, Polynesians came by large outrigger canoes. They brought with them food stocks, animals for production, and their traditional uh, lineage, lineages and ancestor worship and so forth. And they began to build these um, edifices, these images that you see there. Uh, Easter Island at the time that they arrived was heavily treed, heavily forested. Um, they had excellent uh, fishery in the, around the island and so forth, and it was, it was a, a great place to be. Over time, um, when uh, the first uh, uh, Westerners arrived at the island in about 1722, they discovered a barren um, island that could barely support um, a small population, no, absolutely treeless. Um, there were the only ships that the Polynesians now had were pieced together from driftwood, um, small canoes, no, not seaworthy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And 